and welcome to the special Asian Development Bank talk show on startup ecosystems and innovation. I'm your host, Lin Tai. This topic is especially interesting to me because I spent over 20 years in these ecosystems in the US and in Vietnam. I've started a couple startups in the past. I currently advise young entrepreneurs through my EdTech Venture TVL group. I'm an angel investor, and I'm also an advisor to Open Space Ventures. Today, we're going to explore startup ecosystems and why they're so valuable for sustainable economic development. Then, we'll look at what the Asian Development Bank is doing, can do, and will do to support their growth across Asia and the Pacific. Let's get started. I've invited five fascinating guests to chat with me today. The first of those is Stefan Kester, partner and head of ecosystem consulting at the think tank Startup Genome. Stefan, we just had a great conversation off camera. Why are startups important? What's their role in economic development? Yeah, first, first of all, really the economic impacts. So you're creating with, with startups, you're creating highly um, valuable, highly sophisticated employment opportunities for, for younger generations. The impact in terms of, of real job creation, that's a question every politician is asking us, is, is fairly significant. You can, you can see what's happening directly in tech startups, um, particularly as they start to scale. That's, that's an important element. Um, secondly, the indirect effects. So our studies show that for any job created in a startup or in a scale-up company, in a tech company, you create on average four additional jobs in the freelance economy, in the support economy, all the way to the coffee shops, et cetera, that, that are part of, of in the end, a, a tech cluster or a tech community. Last but not least, certainly cultural. Um, startups are fast-paced. They're allowed to try out ideas, try to pivot very quickly if they don't work. So it's a very different cultural dynamic that overall, again, contributes to the competitiveness of a city, a region, even a state. Let's talk about when we have many startups in one area, when we have a startup ecosystem. Could you elaborate on the role of community and its impact on startups? Yeah, so let's 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 have a look at the success that the ecosystem model we've created has has about 120 KPIs, eight dimensions. But some I personally find hugely interesting, and meaning entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs, angel investors helping entrepreneurs, companies, executives, engineers, uh, whoever they are from, from larger corporations are helping um, younger founders without any financial interest. That's the idea of giving back or paying it forward. We found a way to measure this concept, not only talking about it, but really to measure it and to say, what's the quality of the community that you locally have created? It's maybe, from my perspective, one of the most important elements, particularly for younger ecosystems. If you're creating an ecosystem, if you're you're fostering an ecosystem that's the community and this culture you really want, want to strengthen that they're, they're means of doing so. Um, statistically, it's interesting to note all other factors equal. You have the same talent, you have the same funding, you have the same technology knowledge and same programmers in your ecosystem. If you got a very well-functioning community, meaning local connectedness in our lang language and lingo is high, um, your startups will grow their revenue by a factor of 2.1x. Everything else is the same. That's interesting, and it feels really natural to me. When I think about the value that these ecosystems bring to all parties involved, from founders to corporates, I think people would naturally want to contribute to the growth of a startup ecosystem. However, with that said, in your research, what have you found that would stand in the way of this kind of a community? It's the fear of somebody running with my idea, and I lose out. Instead of seeing the benefit of the other guy, the other girl might might have a few ideas that are actually complementary to what I'm doing. Um, it will make my model much more, the, the dialogue will make my model much more competitive. I think one of the roles the Asian Development Bank can play is to bring some of these lessons learned to very early stage ecosystems that are still kind of figuring it all out. What other value can ADB bring as a connector of ecosystems? Global connectedness also and very directly tr translates into a concept we would call global market reach. That's the ability to sell my product to a client, to a customer outside my domestic market in a different continent. Can I go as a European? Can I go to Asia? Can I go to North America? Can I successfully enter that market? What kind of connections do I need? What kind of knowledge? What kind of understanding in order to enter these markets successfully? That's global connectedness and as a derived measure, global market reach, GMR. Um, and again, the statistics are fascinating. So uh, an ecosystem that provides a high level of global connectivity, this exchange with, with entrepreneurs, investors abroad, um, on average allows their startups to grow revenue by a factor of 2.5x the global averages. 
Um, and again, all other factors considered equal, same people, same business models, same funding. Um, again, it shows the power of community and um, it shows what, what we can achieve if you play the bigger we instead of the us in the ecosystem, but really play this, this global fabric of startup ecosystem connections and connectivity. But before you have global connectedness, young ecosystems have to lay the groundwork first, right? And this is especially challenging in developing markets. Is there a template of sorts that countries can follow to learn from those that came before them? You can characterize four phases of ecosystem development, all the way from activation, a very young ecosystem that has certain characteristics and certain measures that would help it grow, all the way to what we would call integration, where it really attracts foreign talent, where it attracts foreign investment, et cetera, the New York, the London, and, 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 and so forth. Important to know, as somebody who looks after the ecosystem, where do I stand? compared to who are my peers in the same, same activation ecosystem, there I can measure, there I can compare myself. Secondly, to understand that there are very distinct policy initiatives, measures, initiatives required to move from one phase to the next as, as the ecosystem starts growing and maturing. Um, so very young ecosystem activation ecosystems that they need to look at, at their community at organic growth. There's no point in trying to attract foreign venture capital a series B plus. It's not going to happen, but really to look what, what do I have? What are my local strengths? What can I work with? While it's an integration ecosystem, it's, it's all about global connectedness, exporting to the world and attracting the best and brightest of talent, the right visa policies, um, the right tax incentives for late stage investment, et cetera. That's, that's a completely different place. It's important to notice these differences and to really have the right roadmap, the right strategy that's in tune with the maturity phase of the ecosystem. Okay, I see. So I assume one strategy would be clustering, right? So let's say my country has these specific natural resources and these specific traditional industries. So it makes sense to focus my ecosystem in these areas. It's a highly debated concept. And we can go back to, to Michael Porter and the, the industrial cluster strategy and, and thesis he, he put forward. Highly debated in startup ecosystems. Um, we at, at Genome, and based on our research and the data we see, we believe clusters have, have a point. And um, why is that so? It is about the density of like-minded people with similar skill sets. So we would, we would look at an ecosystem and say, is there somebody in the industry, even in traditional industry, has a certain skill set in a particular industrial subsector? So if I want to build robotics, to have an example, do I have a manufacturing environment where I have people that have the mechanical skills, the engineering skills, even traditional engineering skills that would help me build a better robotics model? Secondly, would I have an industry environment where I can test my development, my robots or robotic solutions in a real world setting? So all these, these factors play, play into why clusters seem highly effective. And then as a policymaker, you obviously have to ask yourself, do I make an investment into an ecosystem overall or do I want to make a distinct investment into certain subsectors? And that's where the debate then typically starts and where different interest groups typically have, have to argue and, and see, see it here, understand the different arguments. But overall, in conclusion, we would say particularly for smaller environments, smaller ecosystems, a cluster strategy so far has proven conducive to developing faster, developing more competitive, more interesting models and being overall more successful. All right, thanks, Stefan. Let's turn now to Thomas Abel. ADB's Chief of Digital Technology for Development. Thomas, we were just talking with the startup genome, Stefan Kester. He believes that the development strategy for each startup ecosystem should be tailored market by market. Do you agree? Well, this is the interesting thing about it, that there really isn't a template because the, the landscape changes so quickly and you really have to bet on things that you can't be um, completely confident in. That's one of the reasons why this is a very interesting area that the, the ground is shifting so quickly. Countries are always looking to upgrade their current strategies based on the latest and greatest thinking, you know, whether it's new fintech, you know, um, innovations or uh, new cloud computing uh, opportunities. There are many things that can really spur a startup ecosystem um, to a success that's, that's really dependent on the current situation in the the country we're speaking of and dependent on the region that they're participating in. And, um, you know, yeah, really have to try a lot of different things. And, and when something doesn't work, just kind of move on because there's no kind of a guaranteed formula. 
That must make your work really challenging. I mean, it seems like ADB really has to take a differentiated approach in every country that you're working in. Are there any things that ADB can do at the regional level to support startup innovation? Well, we are fairly new in this area. We've been doing um, knowledge products and workshops and TAs probably for the last couple of years. And we have seen um, success. You know, the, the most successful event we had, it was a week long workshop where we had 15 member governments attend uh, where we all went to Korea and looked at the, the successful startup ecosystem there. And I think the lesson there was that Korea has been working on this for, you know, 50, 50 years or more, you know, in terms of trying to turn their economy into a technology leader. And they've tried everything. And um, if you look at anything that's happening there, uh, there's probably some government support somewhere behind it. Um, but it's a wide range and, and huge mix of, of different uh, programs. And they have generated a tremendous success. You know, now they have the largest cell phones and semiconductor manufacturing, and they really have a core technology leadership in many areas. I know that for Korea, as well as other countries such as Singapore, universities are vital components of those ecosystems. Is that a key takeaway for developing countries? Does there need to be a nexus connecting entrepreneurship and higher education? Well, universities are sort of the, um, you know, the raw material for tech startups, because that's where you learn the latest and greatest technologies, you know, certain programming techniques, or, you know, what's the, the latest cloud platform, and people coming out of universities, naturally, you know, want to start their career and, and build up their skills very rapidly. And, and it's just, it's sort of a, a standard model for startups. And I think that's the most important. But we're also seeing a change, you know, where the digital economy is coming along and enabling people to participate without having a university education. You have influencers, you have even just digital advertising, enabling small and medium enterprises that maybe are lower skilled to, um, you know, get into the digital economy. Okay, one final question. I understand there's no template for ecosystem development. But if you were to encourage governments to focus on one or two areas of policy, what would those be? Sure. Yeah, I think that the, um, especially in, you're right in education, that people can learn skills without going through a four-year university degree. And this is something countries can uh, foster. And we've seen, for example, these coding boot camps, many of them are quite successful in picking people with the right level of skills and, you know, in a very short time, turning them into uh, a viable software uh, programmer or software engineer, um, I think also just building the infrastructure so that you can have universal internet connectivity, you know, really would help a lot because a lot of people, you know, most of our countries in the region are just around 50%, you know, internet penetration. And that is not enough, you know, to, for many people, if they just don't have access aren't able to uh, understand that, you know, these uh, opportunities are available. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Now let's get a client perspective. I'm here with Teresa Matawapan, Chief Strategy Officer with Thailand's National Innovation Agency. Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about the NIA? Thanks. So uh, the National Innovation Agency, it's a, it's a government agency, but in a way, it's a kind of semi-autonomous agency, you know, the one that have our own kind of regulations. So the role itself or the mission is to basically uh, push forward uh, mechanisms in order to build up innovation capabilities of the country. By doing that, then we have several mechanisms, you know, in order to um, support uh, the country in terms of the organizations you know, startups or SME or large conglomerates or even uh, researchers or innovators in a way, right? And we work a lot with the private sector. So uh, we have mechanism, what we call like groom, grant and growth. Grooming meaning that you're grooming, uh, you know, uh, innovators from uh, university maybe, you know, or college students up until like uh, corporates and, and, and business people. Uh, and granting is that we have innovation fund. We give fundings, you know, it's a matching fund in a way in, in order to build up innovation. So we call it innovation fund. It's not 
uh, you know, it's it's a it's a next step of R and D funding of the government. So we work a lot with the private sector who owns that technology or or research and development, and then they want to um, move forward with that. You know, trying the market, doing the piloting, uh, commercializations of it. Uh, growth, groom grant and growth. Growth meaning that we try to do business matching and help them in the next stage. You know, going up with that uh, innovations and moved on to uh, a bigger market like international market, and also matching it with investors. So that's in the nutshell of the organizations. As I understand it, you've been pretty successful with that approach. How have you seen the Thai startup ecosystem evolve over the years? I think that in the past five years, including what NAA has been doing, uh, the graph is really you know shooting up in a way, and that comes together with different factors. I think that um, the government itself, in uh, you know NAA as a big part, uh, they they have this mandate, and they understand we understand that uh, startup. Let's say okay, startup is maybe the key. And it's uh, it's the it's part of the ecosystem that we need to build up. So even five years ago, we starting to you know uh, education, doing advocations uh, and knowledge distributions on this, and gathering people. All right, let's talk about some of the challenges. What are some of the headaches that Thailand has faced in growing its ecosystem? Well, first of all, government budget. You know, it's it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's not at the point that we even even. You know, it's like whatever we get, then okay, we use it at the at the optimal level. But uh, human capital or skill labor, in a way, you no know, skill labor in the sense that you know people with um, technology background, and we need to build up those uh, capability of our own people, even people in the region. And I think that's still a um, major, major issue. You know, like how new company startups cannot uh, get resources in terms of human capitals. They don't know how to grow further or go internationally. Um, and and that's still, uh, I think, an issue or challenge that we need to help. Looking at Thailand, a lot of the economic activity is concentrated in Bangkok. Is that true for the startup ecosystem as well? For the past years or two, we starting to you know understand that hey, Thailand is not only Bangkok, right? Thailand is it's everywhere, and even when we talk about region, it's not only you know one country. So we need to look at things in the, in the more broader perspective, in order for uh, build to build up the innovation capability. So we need to go outside of Bangkok, and that's how we starting to build up the nodes we call like innovation nodes. Uh, one is in, of course, major city like Chiang Mai or Khon Gan, you know, not Eastern. Or even the South, we are one of the agency that go to the like kind of down South of Thailand, uh, you know. And so with these, uh, we would say regional hub. Then we try to match all these mechanism and put it there and putting people there and working with the the people in the region, being the uh, size park in the region, the infrastructures, the government or the um, municipalities, the, the, you know, the people in the local area in order to help with uh, social innovations or bringing in, you know, mechanism in order to support and build innovation driven enterprise or startups over there with their technology, with their, you know, problems in the in the areas. Thanks, Teresa. Now let's turn to Dominic Meller. I first met Dominic when he was leading an ecosystem building project providing technical assistance in Teresa's region, the Greater Mekong subregion called the Mekong Business Initiative. And now he's Principal Investment Specialist with ADB Ventures. Welcome, Dominic. From your work within ADB operations, what do you think are some of ADB's more valuable ecosystem interventions across the region? So that there are different approaches uh, and all of them are important and complementary. So in terms of more ecosystem type of approaches, uh, ADB has uh, supported uh, angel investor networks. So of course, governments in the region also have an important role to play in building the ecosystem. Uh, for example, providing um, resources to universities, uh, business incubators to commercialize, commercialize intellectual property, uh, helping uh, those uh, great inventions to take them to market, 
And sometimes there might be policy priorities in terms of specific sectors, specific verticals that governments are interested in. So across the region, we've been providing business advisory support to governments uh, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia to help them develop their innovation ecosystem programs. Okay, let's talk about ADB Ventures. Where did the concept come from and what are the gaps you're trying to fill? Yeah, so the the ADB Ventures falls under our private sector operations, and we're essentially the venture capital arm of Asian Development Bank, and we provide direct equity investments to early stage companies that have got really great, bold solutions, solving the biggest development problems in the region. Uh, We currently have a a focus primarily on uh, addressing climate change and uh, gender inequality. Uh, There are a lot of great technologies out there. Many of them have already gained traction in uh, a more developed uh, market ecosystem, but they've yet to penetrate and scale um, uh, widely across our developing uh, member countries. We are also interested in uh, gender inequality. So specifically, we apply a gender investment lens to all our activities. It's not just about the ownership and the management, although we do consider that we want to make sure that uh, we're gender neutral, essentially, but we're also interested in the actual market. So from a perspective of does do what products and solutions can actually uh, reach women, uh, females, uh, particularly low income uh, groups, uh, women that are uh, vulnerable to the adverse uh, effects of climate, uh, and, and so forth. So, and cr- critically, we also are looking to crowd in uh, private sector capital. So we often co-invest. Uh, we, we do measure our success also by how much uh, private capital we leverage. So the majority of investments we do, we're co-investing with uh, angel, other angel investors, uh, sorry, just angel investors, family offices, uh, impact funds, VCs, and corporate. So that's a really, really important indicator for us as well. Okay, so within those categories, what is ADB Ventures looking for in the companies you invest in? So we we believe that uh, commercial uh, returns and uh, impact returns or impact size are very closely uh, correlated, first of all, because if a business doesn't scale and it can only have impact at a uh, smaller local level, not to say it's a bad business, there are a lot of great businesses having very important impact at a local level. Uh, level. But as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to address regional problems, pain points that are not just relevant to Vietnam or Cambodia or China, but uh, solutions that can be scaled across multiple geographies and multiple clients and therefore have large impact. So by definition, if they were to scale and have that impact. Okay, great. Thanks, Dominic. ADP Ventures is a new and innovative development model. Let's dig a little bit deeper. It appears as if ADB support for startup ecosystems is growing and quickly evolving. Our last guest today is Cleo Kawawaki, who chairs ADB's Digital Working Group. Cleo, could you tell me a little bit about your background and your experiences, and what has led you to the work you're doing today? So I joined ADB 20 years ago. Uh- <laughs> So it's been quite a while. Well, before that, I was an investment banker uh, covering ADB. Within the 20 years, it's uh, been a quite a, I mean, the incredible thing is that uh, ADB gives you so many opportunities to do things that, you know, I didn't imagine when I entered. I mean, I was just a co-financing officers doing guarantees. And then, of course, with my background, uh, I went into, you know, privatization because I had privatized UK um, electricity companies before and then becoming an energy specialist and an energy director and now um, the deputy director general of Southeast Asia and now on to the Central West. So, so many opportunities, so many iterations of, and I guess the thing that I love most is that the, the ADB is willing to let you try things Okay, so you're in the Central West Regional Department, and we just spoke with Dominic Meller in private sector operations, and also Thomas Abel in digital technology for development. Now, these experts in ecosystem building projects are spread all over the bank. So what's the, what's the connective tissue, and how is ADB ensuring that the knowledge and lessons are shared between them? I think the connecting uh, tissue, as you say, is the client. What can we do for the client? What is best for the client? How can we 
support the client to do things better, faster, and well, frankly, cheaper. Why not try something that's worked somewhere else? I mean, we can you know, lead the countries or we can support the countries to realize that there's different uh, solutions. And then, uh, for instance, we like doing pilots. And uh, piloting an idea, uh, getting together, and then that pilot spreads to other countries. Okay, so is supporting startup ecosystems going to continue to be a growing area for ADB operations? Absolutely. I mean, if we look at um, my region, the Carrick region, I mean, only 6% uh, of the population have, uh, you know, digital access. I mean, so I mean, if we're thinking about the future of digitization, they have to have the infrastructure, they have the regulatory, they have to have, well, the innovators that come in. And all of this, you know, can be facilitated by the government. I mean, we do infrastructure, of course, that's very easy. You know, we, we can support government, uh, you know, the private sector can concentrate on what is uh, profitable, you know, in the urban areas. And if the government wants to spread out to the rural areas to cut that digital divide, the rural urban divide, uh, we can support through our financing or through our guarantees or through uh, you know the various instruments. I mean, we have all the the products under one roof, so we have the freedom. You know, the government has the freedom to look at our one menu and say like, well, that's appropriate for this situation. How are ADB clients, in other words, government leaders in ADB's member countries, receiving your advice? Do you find yourself having to convince them that this is the right way to do things? So we never take the position that what this is the right way of doing things. Because when we try to do that, you're trying to fit a you know round peg in a square hole. So we're going, we always say like it has to be individualized. It has to fit your country, your region. Um, so we have a lot of examples and we have a lot of analysis to say, well, this is the analysis. This is the way that you see things. So what do you think? I mean, they all have their digital strategy. They've all been thinking about this. So we're not trying to drag anyone to one set of standards. We're saying, okay, look, there are so many options and there are so many things that you can do. Come on, uh, let me know what you want to do. Let me know what your objectives are. And let's get together, talk about it with your regional peers and see where you know there's a match of your objectives and where the best standards are and to have it as a regional standard or for a country standard. Okay, so let's say you've supported a client with their digital agenda. How do governments sustain and maintain what you've helped them build? Well, go to the next step. And that's where a fair taxation comes in uh, for things that are going well. You know, well, you gave the tax break in the first place. Then there has to be the next step of having the reliable revenues from that innovation or from the, from the industry that you've created. So things are so new. Uh, <laughs> There are no tax laws at the moment, so what ADB could do was to is to support developing a taxation system for something like e-commerce or other aspects of um, the digital revolution to make sure that the governments can keep on doing the work uh, that's too well, risky for the private sector to go into. Okay, so how will you continue to support governments create pilots and to test new ideas? So for some of the pilots, um, it's really simple. You pass it over to the private sector and they go on and make money. <laughs> uh, but for some of the sectors, uh, like regulations, like the infrastructure systems, that may not be so, well, lucrative or financially uh, viable, economically viable, but not financially viable government has to keep the funding going. And uh, that's where the importance of fair taxation comes in. So we have to create a new regime uh, because some of these areas, you know, it's never been done before. Uh, so we can support the governments to come up with um, 
a way of sustaining innovation by reliable domestic resource mobilization and fair taxation. So that's where I think that the sustainability has to go because you have to pay with the fair share to continue with the innovation, to continue improving the infrastructure, the ecosystem that allows for more innovation. That's the responsibility of the government to come up with uh, and implement. And we're every bit as much committed to supporting that sustainability. Okay, great. Thanks, Cleo. This discussion has highlighted the need as well as the complexities involved in the growth and maintenance of a startup ecosystem. Building ecosystems for startups and innovation has clear economic development impact. It means valuable, sophisticated employment opportunities for young talent. And for every tech startup job created, there are four additional jobs created elsewhere in the economy. And that's great! But building a thriving innovation ecosystem is a long-term process. Korea, one of the leading examples in the region, has spent decades building their ecosystem. It takes patience. And most importantly, it requires a unique approach in each country and each region, a context-aware approach that accounts for that country's competitive strengths and unique business and policy environment. ADB clearly has a role to play in this arena. The bank can share best practices, provide technical assistance, finance digital infrastructure, and much more. And the exact mix of those tools is something that needs to be identified through dialogue, partnerships, and an iterative approach that produces unique but well-networked ecosystems. I want to thank my guests today, Stefan Kester, Thomas Abel, Teresa Matawapan, Dominic Meller, and Cleo Kawawaki. If you've enjoyed this program, be sure to check out ADB's ongoing video series, Climatic. Each episode on Climatic will highlight a different high-impact sector. You'll see me interview the innovators who are reducing Asia's carbon footprint, the entrepreneurs who are making the Asia Pacific more resilient to climate change, and the corporate leaders who are partnering with startups for impact. Check us out on the Asian Development Bank's YouTube channel. I'm Lin Tai, and that's it for today's program. Keep growing, keep innovating, keep resilient. <laughs>